Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you all to the Hush Blackwell presentation on coronavirus and FDA regulated industries, um, a primer on what you need to know. Um, I'm joined with uh, a number of my colleagues in the practice. Um, Tamar Hodges will be taking on the, the role of helping us understand coronavirus and its symptoms. Uh, Emily Lyons is going to be tackling the environmental and animal issues, as, uh, how they relate to manufacturing operations. And Tyler Hibbler is going to be providing uh, labor and employment advice and answers on questions that they've been receiving on coronavirus. My name is Seth Mailhunt. I'm a partner and head of the FDA regulatory practice at Hush Blackwell. Um, the main purpose of what we've been doing is to develop a comprehensive plan and report for companies in any number of FDA regulated areas, um, whether it's foods, drugs, medical devices, dietary supplements, tobacco products. Um, and other areas. Uh, we want to be sure that we had a report that they could use with actionable items that would help them prepare. Um, the presentation today is to give everyone an overview of what is in that report, which uh, we will then tailor for every client's specific needs as uh, they uh, opt to, to enroll in this program. Um, the main points we're talking about coronavirus, um, and it's helpful to understand what the terminology is, um, as least as far as what we're using in our presentation today. Um, the novel corona coronavirus that was initially detected in Wuhan, China, in December of 2019, we're calling SARS-CoV-2. Um, the disease that is caused by SARS-CoV-2 is coronavirus disease 2019, and it's been abbre abbreviated COVID-19. And when we talk about coronavirus, there are a number of other human coronaviruses that we've encountered uh, nationally that I wanted to make sure we've got uh, everyone's input on. The... Uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. Um, we've abbreviated SARS-CoV. And then the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS coronavirus, that's MERS-CoV. And then there are another group of human coronaviruses that are endemic, and those are HCOVs. So a couple of key considerations before we launch into some of the substance on these slides. One of the things I want to point out um, in developing this program, uh, you have uh, uh, the, the information we've received to date and that I've been compiling and others have been compiling. We've noted that the experts are not in complete agreement. So when we go through these slides, you'll notice that we've presented them from a number of different agencies and regulatory authorities, both national and international. The main point here is that there are key differences in how these agencies are presenting this information, uh, both for the public and for industry. Um, so we want to highlight that. Um, and Basically, you know, we've been working on this issue now for the last two weeks at least. And, you know, what we've learned about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is evolving daily. And if you are making decisions based on the information that you have available today or that you've developed over the last week or two, um, we strongly recommend that you review that information frequently because information is changing daily. In fact, 
Uh, just this morning, another report came out regarding the uh, persistence of coronavirus on surfaces, which supports some of the initial information that had been gathered and presented in a prior report. Um, because of the sensitivity surrounding COVID-19, uh, we strongly recommend that companies seek legal counsel on any key decisions. Um, there are a variety of decisions that need to be made. For example, whether or not to incorporate policies that are specific to COVID-19 into, for example, food safety plans, HACCP plans, quality systems, um, and making those decisions and weighing the ramifications, uh, we strongly suggest going to outside counsel for that, if only to help insulate yourself from the regulatory risks that are present in making decisions on this issue, as it is such a fast-moving factor. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Tamar Hodges soon, but I did want to point out that, as I've mentioned, the complete clinical picture with regard to COVID-19 is not fully understood. Um, that point is clear, uh, whether it's related to the symptoms, um, how illnesses progress into uh, serious illnesses versus uh, minor illnesses. Uh, we know, for example, that some of those are related to the age of the patient or whether there are comorbidities or, or other uh, illnesses that uh, if they're immunocompromised. Um, the method of transmission, uh, we believe, is generally thought to be person to person through small droplets from the nose or mouth. Um, but given the permanence and the persistence of uh, SARS to uh, COV2, um, the Potential for illnesses to be transmitted from surfaces, um, as well as some um, concerns about whether there may be a uh, food pathway, um, are things that need to continue to be monitored. And certainly with the World Health Organization um, declaration that this is the first pandemic caused by the coronavirus. And in the past two weeks, obviously, the number of cases have increased 13-fold or more, and the affected number of countries has tripled. Um, countries are taking very aggressive actions, both here in the United States and abroad, and it includes closing um, entire industries uh, as well as taking very aggressive action to contain the virus through community spread. So I'm going to hand it off to Tamara to see, uh, have her perspective as a registered nurse on some of these uh, issues. Thank you, Seth. All right, and as he mentioned, my name is Tamara Hodges, and I'm a registered nurse and healthcare regulatory attorney here at Hush Blackwell, and I will be discussing the clinical aspects of COVID-19. As mentioned earlier in the presentation, experts are not in complete agreement, including the World Health Organization or WHO and the CDC. According to WHO, studies to date suggest that the virus that causes COVID-19 is mainly transmitted through contact with respiratory droplets rather than through the air. The disease can spread from person to person through small droplets from the nose or mouth, which are spread when a person with COVID-19 coughs or exhales. These droplets land on objects and surfaces around the person. Other people then catch COVID-19 by touching these objects and surfaces and then touching their eyes, nose, or mouth. People can also catch COVID-19 if they breathe in droplets from a person with COVID-19 who coughs, or, who coughs out or exhales droplets. This is why it is important to stay more than three feet away from a person who is sick. Now, the CDC also asserts that COVID-19 is spread through respiratory droplets, but its opinion about the appropriate social distance differs from who. So according to the CDC, the virus is spread through person-to-person uh, -person 
who are in close contact with each other at a distance of six feet. These droplets can land in the mouths and nose, noses of people who are nearby or possibly be inhaled into the lungs. People are thought to be the most contagious when they are most symptomatic. Some spread may be possible before people show symptoms. There have been reports of this occurring with these, I'm sorry, this, this, there have been reports of this occurring with this new coronavirus, but this is not thought to be the way that the virus spreads mainly. Um, I also want to take a moment before we go to the next slide to talk about the distinction between airborne uh, transmission and droplet transmission. Um, as I noted, no public health agency has indicated that COVID-19 is an airborne transmission. Airborne transmission essentially means that the virus floats in the air after someone talks, coughs, sneezes, etc. So therefore, direct contact with an infected person is not needed in order to get sick. A well-known example of an airborne illness would be tuberculosis or TB. For droplet transmission, on the other hand, the virus travels inside tiny droplets after an infected person sneezes or coughs, and the droplet lands in the other person's eyes, nose, or mouth, hence the recommendation to keep your hands, eyes, nose, and mouth clean and clear. So who hey, in tomorrow, CDC also... Hey, oh, sorry, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry derail you there. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no worries. I just wanted to highlight for, for people, you know, obviously when we're looking at production facilities and spacing of employees, you know, the difference between six feet and three feet is, uh, could be the difference between whether you're running a particular production line or not. So when you do make an assessment of particular production areas and whether or not those could potentially continue to operate um, under the risk of uh, coronavirus uh, uh, outbreak in a particular region or area, uh, one of the things you need to consider is weighing these different recommendations and, and what makes the most sense. Sorry, go ahead, Tamar. No, no, thank you. No, that's good. That's good commentary. Thank you. So as I was mentioning, the WHO and CDC also have differing opinions about the clinical manifestations of COVID-19. And as you'll see on the next slide when I get there, some of the symptoms that WHO uh, attributes to COVID-19 actually mirror symptoms of a common cold or flu. The incubation period for COVID-19 is up to 14 days hence the 14-day isolation and quarantine requirements. Now, real quickly, I also want to point out the difference between the differences between an isolation and quarantine because commentary out there have been using those terms interchangeably, um, but there is a subtle distinction. So an isolation means that you take a person who's already infected, already sick, and you separate them from other people, whereas quarantine means you separate a person who's been exposed but not necessarily exhibiting signs and symptoms to monitor to see if they become sick. Also, to clarify what the term incubation means, uh, the incubation period is the time from when someone is exposed to the virus and for when the first symptoms may appear. And so the incubation period can be up to 14 days, which means someone could be exposed to and have contracted COVID-19, but not show the symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath until that 14-day mark. Okay. So here, as I mentioned, you can see a lot of the overlap between COVID-19, the cold, and the flu. And this, with the cold here, you'll see that you typically will exhibit signs of a productive cough, which in other words is a wet cough, so you are coughing up sputum or mucus, sneezing, a runny or stuffy nose, and a sore throat. Whereas with the flu, in addition to having a fever and a dry cough, like with the coronavirus, you'll also have signs such as fatigue, body aches, and headaches. Now on this chart, I just want to point out, um, this is a very good graphic to show the comparison between COVID-19 and influenza, but I do want to point out that 
Um, as Hopkins suggests on this graphic, um, it, it, they state that COVID-19 could potentially be airborne, but as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, WHO or CDC have not come out with any evidence to show that COVID-19 could be spread in a way other than through respiratory droplets. However, our understanding of this disease continues to evolve daily, and so as Seth mentioned, we encourage you to frequently keep up with the new guidelines as they come out because it very well could evolve to become an airborne transmission as well. All right, and finally, I will wrap up my component on the clinical aspect with talking about the COVID-19 clinical testing. So the CDC has established criteria for testing a person under investigation or under PUI due to the limited availability of testing kits. The CDC is encouraging testing of only high-risk people, which are people who develop signs and symptoms of coronavirus, so the fever, coughing, shortness of breath, within 14 days of close contact with someone who has COVID-19 or after traveling to a high-risk region, and uh, the high-risk regions right now as seen by the CDC or level one um, regions, which are China, Italy, Iran, and South Korea. The testing is the same as it would be with the flu testing. It's a, it's a, different, um, it's a different method of testing or a different um, um, substance that's used, rather, but it still involves the nasopharyngeal swab and clinicians should be able to access those lab, lab tests through any clinical lab that it routinely uses for diagnostic testing, so long as those labs have the FDA-approved kits that, are, that have been applied for under the EUA or emergency use authorization, which Seth or Emily will talk more about. All public health labs have access to the CDC's testing, so just want to make clear there's a distinction. Clinical and commercial labs have or should have applied for a special permit to have their kits approved by the FDA under an emergency circumstances, whereas the public health labs are getting their kits directly from the CDC. And that's all I have on the clinical portion, and I will hand it over uh, to Emily Air Force Staff to jump in. Well, yeah, I'm going to jump in just to, to discuss brave, basically, you know, what, what this means, you know, the, the lack of testing, particularly in the United States, um, will have a significant impact on businesses. Uh, if they are producing a product that needs to be controlled um, and where employee health can impact the quality or the safety of the product. I think any company that um, produces an FDA-regulated product needs to be prepared for the eventuality that they will be producing a product where some quantity will have been produced by an employee who will contract COVID-19 at some point during the production process. And identifying when that actually happens may come well after the product's been shipped. And so what are the questions that companies will need to grapple with now, ideally, is to what extent they need to set limits or rationales for why product would need to be recovered or would not need to be recovered if such an event were to occur. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, the, you know, we'll talk a little bit about employee monitoring and health shortly, but um, certainly, you know, FDA has provided emergency use, use authorization for COVID-19 tests. I do want to highlight that what we've been learning from some um, uh, physicians across the country is that not if a test is done privately, that may not be that they not those tests may not be reported necessarily to public health authorities, which makes understanding whether or not there has been an employee with the disease um, difficult to establish if the employee is not forthcoming. 
I uh, want to highlight that risk for any companies out there that are in active production and are concerned about these issues. So um, certainly any measures that you take um, need to be based on an assumption that you know, some employees may actually be infected um, instead of having a plan now versus a plan if and when that happens. So, Emily, you're, you're up next. Right. Hi, everyone. This is Emily Lyons. Um, I'm an associate in the Washington, D.C. office that focuses on uh, FDA-regulated uh, products, uh, most specifically in the food environment, but also work with Seth on all of the other uh, FDA-regulated commodities. Um, as most of you know, or those of you that are manufacturers or even retail food service um, companies that are on the line, uh, most of the regulatory schemes that we are regulated under as manufacturers or providers of FDA regulated products um, have regulatory schemes that, requ that have requirements for monitoring of illnesses. Uh, um, and, you know, that can be done through supervisory observation or specific required medical examination. Um, those are usually going to be done through your GMPs whether it's for a drug, uh, medical device, or food, um, and then the monitoring requirements under the food code for uh, food service providers. Uh, the monitoring is generally directed at preventing employees from contaminating regulated products, but they do not act as an absolute bar uh, from a manufacturing operation, uh, you know, continuing its operations. As, you know, Seth kind of indicated earlier, there, you know, you're going to need to make some decisions as employers, uh, you know, and, and food or drug or medical device providers, uh, what you're going to do with some products if, if an employee does eventually, um, you know, test positive for COVID-19. Um, and we're highly recommending that employers, you know, establish uh, COVID-19 specific monitoring controls that are tailored and risk-based to the risks associated with COVID-19, recognizing that, you know, the symptomology of COVID-19 is very similar to influenza as Tamar uh, discussed earlier. Uh, so, especially in a manufacturing or in a food service environment, uh, we're, we need to take a focus on our surfaces. Um, you know, we have many in a manufacturing environment and also, you know, in a food preparation. And CDC and the WHO have, um, you know, maybe not necessarily conflicting positions on surface transmission, uh, but they have made some statements on it. Uh, the CDC indicates that it is possible for individuals to, uh, you know, contract COVID-19 by touching a surface or an object that has the virus on it, um, and then would go and touch their face, their nose, their mouth, or their eyes. Um, but they don't believe this is the main way that the virus is spread. This is, again, why many of the recommendations have been to, you know, continue following, you know, hand washing protocols and ensuring good hygiene, and then also limiting touching of your face. Uh, the WHO has also said, you know, they are not certain how long the virus cons um, is persisting on surfaces in the environment, but it is behaving like other coronaviruses have, um, that they have, you know, more studies available on. Uh, they are, are, are the, some of the research that the WHO is, you know, relying their uh, determinations on show that uh, coronaviruses can last on surfaces for as short as a few hours and up to several days, but it's going to be highly dependent on the conditions uh, of that location. Uh, for example, in a manufacturing environment, you may have different temperatures or humidities. Um, you may have different types of surfaces uh, like metal or, um, you know, plastics. It's really just going to depend. Uh, and there have been some studies that have looked specifically at sars cov um, mers cov and um, h cov and it's really showing that these types of coronaviruses can persist on inanimate surfaces like metal, glass, or plastics up to approximately nine days. Um, and as Seth discussed earlier, there has been some more recent research, you know, issued this morning uh, that is indicating that this nine-day period is looking approximately accurate for COVID-19. Uh, uh, 
human coronaviruses are generally um, inactivated uh, from surface disinfection procedures. Uh, and, you know, ethanol, hydrogen peroxide, and sodium hypochlorate have uh, been indicated as, you know, at certain concentrates it's working well to inactivate um, coronaviruses. And then um, some of the other biocidal agents that are used um, are less effective. So this provides manufacturers and food service providers an opportunity to review what um, you know, sanitizing agents they're using um, and cross-referencing it with the FDA registered uh, products. They have a list that specifically has disinfectants for use um, against, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19. They have a specific list that they've issued um, that, you know, manufacturers have the opportunity uh, to look at to determine if they'd like to introduce another sanitizing agent um, or, you know, can cross-reference whether or not they're currently using a sanitizing agent that might be able to limit the spread of COVID-19 in their facilities um, if it does end up, um, you know, uh, if you do have any employees that end up exhibiting symptoms or testing positive. Uh, so we're going to focus a little bit on transmission of food, um, specifically within the FDA regulated space, partially because it's just a little bit different than a drug or a medical device. Um, some of the you know statutory prohibitions and the concerns related to that. Um, and we're going to go through what some of the different agencies have said. Uh, specifically, the WHO has indicated um, that there may be some confer concerns surrounding food transmission. Um, really, they're focused more, though, on the zoonotic transmission from animals. Um, they've recommended uh, protecting yourself or not going to live animal markets. Um, also ensuring that good food safety practices are used at all levels of food production, um, from farm all the way to fork. Um, and then also making sure to handle raw meat, eggs, or animal organs um, uh, safely as well as um, insuming, um, ensuring uh, adequate cooking or preparation of those products. However, at this point in time, there's no information that indicates that animal products are a vector to human disease transmission in any way. Uh, the CDC's recommendations really focus more on uh, safe food handling. Uh, so they recommend limiting food sharing between individuals, uh, strengthening health screenings for cafeteria and food service workers um, and those that they're in close contact with, and then also ensuring uh, stringent and strict hygiene practices. Um, and many of these are, you know, at least on the food service side, requirements under the food code, um, and many of the things that we follow in our GMP and uh, hygiene practices within our manufacturing environment. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has stated that at this time they're not aware of any illness, human illnesses that suggest that COVID-19 is transmitted through food or food packaging um, because we've been receiving a number of questions recently about food packaging um, due to surface uh, tr uh, transmission questions um, and questions about the persistence of COVID-19. Um, and again, USDA is recommending good hygiene practices. Uh, and safe handling of food, both at the manufacturing and, um, you know, food service and home environment. And this is actually just a little out of date as of this morning. FDA has issued uh, a comprehensive FAQ that is now including uh, a couple of questions related to food. They are reiterating a lot of what USDA and the other agencies have said. There's no evidence that supports transmission of COVID-19 associated with product, food products including those that are imported from areas um, that uh, are, you know, level one uh, areas that have had uh, pervasive um, outbreaks of COVID-19. Um, they've also said that they don't, do not believe uh, that there is evidence of the spread um, from pa food packaging, um, and they also have some recommendations for food workers uh, specific to COVID-19, but generally pointing to uh, the retail food code, uh, you know, for food service providers to be following. Uh, and then this was mentioned earlier, but there are a number of travel restrictions that uh, are uh, being suggested or um, enforced by the CDC and now um, the president specifically. 
China and Iran are recommended to limit um, travelers to only essential or recommend avoiding all non-essential travel um, and entry of foreign nationals from these countries has been suspended. South Korea and Italy, it's uh, also recommended to avoid all non-essential travel. Um, Japan, uh, the CDC is recommending that older adults who have chronic medical conditions not travel to Japan. Um, and then Hong Kong, they're suggesting their usual um, practice uh, of precautions for health restrictions in Hong Kong. Um, and then as of last night, many of you probably uh, watched the president make the announcement that as of midnight on March 13th, uh, foreign nationals traveling to the U.S. from 26 European countries, this does not include Ireland and the U.K., um, are not going to be allowed to enter the U.S. Uh, there was some confusion about whether or not this was going to include uh, imported products from Europe, but through a tweet, the President did clarify that this is focused on foreign nationals entering the United States um, from certain European countries. And just with these travel restrictions, you know, we think manufacturers as well as, you know, food service providers need to keep in mind uh, the impact that this is going to have on audits as well as third-party certification of products um, in an international supply chain as well as within your domestic supply chain um, because this is it's going to affect not only where you'll be able to source products, but being able to verify the safety of the production of these products. For example, um, FDA has suspended foreign inspections except for what they're calling mission critical inspections outside of the U.S. through April, and, and they could potentially exp expand that. Um, additionally, uh, you know, supply chains are encouraged to find alternative methods for establishing their their purchase controls, um, as, as you know, especially as manufacturers, many of you use purchasing controls to ensure safe products um, and safe ingredients uh, for your products are being introduced into your facilities. Um, and it's recommended that you look at other ways besides just relying on third-party audits um, or, go or governmental audits. Um, and then additionally, we recommend that delays to your routine monitoring, um, such as internal audits and management reviews, just need to be appropriately documented um, as to why there may be delays to that. And then just some other supply chain management and mitigation that we're recommending is that you really should plan for possible product supply disruptions. Um, and in order to help mitigate some of that, you should identify additional suppliers from different regions and countries um, and attempt to identify ones that are potentially unaffected by COVID-19 or that are not as affected um, since it is likely for you know, COVID-19 to continue to spread around the world now that we've reached pandemic uh, status from the WHO. Uh, and then additionally, when you're doing this identification of additional suppliers, you may, you may want to consider mapping out um, your supplier sources when evaluating potential supply chain constraints just to make sure that somewhere farther upstream than your most immediate supplier is not going to be where you are restricted. Um, and then also some other things that you may want to consider are establishing heightened quarantine or disinfection procedures for supplied materials if that is appropriate for um, a product that is coming into your facility. Um, just to ensure that you're not inter introducing uh, COVID-19 unintentionally into uh, your supply chain. Um, and with that, I think I'm handing things over to Seth. Thanks, Emily. So let's run through some of the key recommendations that we're we're providing to, to some clients. I mean, wherever you are, regardless of what the current FDA recommendations or USDA recommendations are, uh, any FDA regulated company should develop its own comprehensive policy to address COVID-19 in its production areas and in its uh, facilities. It should cover and consider the regulatory and legal risks, uh, the public health obligations, how to maintain business operations to avoid national and international supply shortages, um, addressing 
employee health and safety, you always have to consider the reputational harm, um, that being a uh, link to an outbreak can pose, and considering product quality. As we mentioned, there are a number of interfaces where employee health needs to be monitored, where uh, you've got uh, obligations for sanitation practices within your facility. Uh, it's not unreasonable to anticipate FDA investigators, at least in the U.S., when they do an inspection, will ask questions focused on employee health and sanitation practices in light of the coronavirus outbreak. Um, regardless of you know how you determine where your your policy needs to lead you, you know, and we're not necessarily recommending that you know any particular efforts be taken in any area, but whatever decisions you make for your facility in light of what's going on, you should seek legal counsel on those key decisions and make sure that anything that any policy that's developed is reviewed by an attorney. So, you know, regardless of guidance or regulation, the laws and the regulations do require companies to consider the challenges that are presented by SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Because of the, the differences that we're seeing in the public health community, as well as the, you know, the differences in opinion and the lack of information, you have to use whatever facts and science are available at the time when you make your decisions. But your policy should be tailored for your specific product, facility, or process. You know, a, a production area where employees are shoulder to shoulder might need to consider different steps than a production area where there are very few employees because most of the process is automated. Um, products that go through sterilization or some other step that would uh, be established to inoculate the virus might be different than products that are not sterilized or are not processed in a way that would eliminate the risks of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, apart from the uh, initial information that FDA has provided, um, they haven't provided much actionable guidance for industry. Um, and while USDA has offered some guidance specifically tailored to industry, um, we believe that some of the recent recommendations from CDC may potentially be in conflict with some of that guidance. So you need to essentially take all of the available information and process it in a way that you reach your own conclusion. And as long as you're doing it in a way that's scientifically reasonable under the, the regulations and appropriately reviewed and uh, authorized, that we think that that provides you with sufficient defense on uh, those uh, decisions that you're making in your, in your field. So, Given the fact that there's a lot of overlap because a lot of our, our discussion is based on employee health and whether or not employees can work in a particular area or not based on the symptoms they show or whether there's a diagnosis, we felt it was really important to have uh, one of our employment law team come and speak on the employment law consideration. So I'm going to hand it over to Tyler who's been focused on COVID-19 issues in employment law. Thank you, Seth. And as with everything else related to this virus, the world of employment law is rapidly changing as there are more and more cases of, of exposure or potential exposure to the virus. Um, on that note, 
employers should be aware of various legal regulations which apply, um, primarily the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act in connection with monitoring your workforce and ensuring that you're employing appropriate workforce management in connection with this situation. A primary question that is often asked is whether or not medical examinations of employees can be conducted. And according to the EEOC and the ADA, uh, this is typically a very fact-based consideration. Um, and, and to not sound too lawyerly, typically it depends. Uh, to de determine whether an employee is a direct threat, which would uh, open the door for a medical examination, an employer must assess the level of threat that the employee's medical condition poses to the workplace. Um, an employee's medical condition poses a direct threat if the severity of the condition presents a substantial risk of significant harm. Now, this I'd be remiss if I didn't say this, that the EOC has published guidelines uh, directing employers in connection with pandemic responses. And based upon the WHO certification or statement yesterday that this is a pandemic, it is likely that the analysis of a direct threat for employers has now reached the level uh, at which employers can consider instituting medical examinations. Uh, the most logical of these is often temperature checks of employees. Uh, there is a lot of literature disputing the validity of temperature checks and when they're appropriate, but it is something that can be considered by employers based upon the direct threat level. If you're considering instituting medical examinations of employees that are currently employed, I would, consider, I would suggest that you reach out to counsel to discuss the specific circumstances affecting your workplace and why you believe those should be instituted and the manner in which they should. Obviously, uh, any and all examinations should be administered in a way which is non-discriminatory and not focused upon an individual's race or national origin. And that is particularly important in a situation such as this where uh, the disease is associated with certain regions or countries throughout the globe. Additionally, in managing a workforce, one of the primary issues that has arisen is what questions can we ask our employees regarding work um, and their, their disabilities. The EOC has published on their website a pre-pandemic survey that they've indicated employers can send out to employees to determine their ability to come to work uh, in light of a, a pandemic that may be, you know, may be in your area. Uh, that's identified on this slide at the bottom. It's also accessible through the EEOC's website. And that may be important for you to determine what the availability may be of your workplace in case of an, a situation where there's a high level of exposure within your area. One of the questions that has just been asked in the presentation is, would it be reasonable to screen workers via temperature check prior to entering a production area? And would that violate any laws? Uh, as I just said, I think based upon the certification of this disease as a pandemic, uh, and if there's a situation where there's an exposure within your region, or there's a, a reasonable belief that there could be an exposure, uh, it would be appropriate to consider instituting temperature checks, especially if an employee is producing products which will be sent out on a, on a mass scale. I'll just add to that you know, for food production in particular, there is a specific regulatory requirement to monitor employees. So if it's determined that a temperature check is a reasonable action to take to ensure that employees do not contaminate food products, I think that that would be something that FDA would permit. And if there was any questions over the appropriateness of that measure, you would have at least the uh, FDA regulations to point to that would allow you to, to say that, look, this is something that's part of our good manufacturing practice requirements, and we've determined that it's appropriate to safeguard the safety of our product. And on that note, Seth, I agree completely, and I think that folds into the 
uh, direct threat assessment which employers can conduct in connection with the ADA and the EEOC requirements. Um, so I, I think that would further substantiate a, a justification to institute temperature checks. The next issue of, of questions which are commonly asked is, is how much information an employer can request from an employee uh, who calls in sick, uh, and questions related to employees about absences from work or advising an employee to leave work when they are visibly sick uh, traditionally are not protected as a disability-related event under the ADA. As a result, employers have the right to ask employees who are absent from work why they were absent, uh, and two, to request that employees who are displaying symptoms of illness to leave work. Uh, that being said, information associated with an employee's medical condition should be kept confidential and must be kept confidential under the law, uh, even if they're found to have the virus. And so this obviously leads to the next logical question, which is, well, then how do we advise our, co our fellow coworkers or individuals who may have been exposed to the virus that somebody has it? That communication, one, should be made, absolutely, but two, should be made in a manner which still preserves individuals' confidentiality. Uh, so you should work with the individual who is diagnosed as being you know, positive for the virus, discuss with them who they may have had contact with, and then provide notification to those individuals in a manner which still protects confidentiality. Uh, we've discussed body temperature and body temperature checks. Um, so I think that's appropriately covered. Next, does the ADA allow employers to require uh, symptomatic employees to stay home? Yes. Um, it, very common advice to inform any infected workers to stay home, and that is not a disability-related action. The next question is, may an employer require a doctor's note uh, prior to allowing an infected individual to come back to work? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, however, there has been recommendations by the EEOC and the CDC to limit those requests when an employee is coming back to work for a doctor's note. Uh, one, and this is primarily based off of the fact that they don't want to overtax the healthcare system in connection with requests for doctor's notes for individuals who are being treated or screened for this disease. Uh, based upon that, the traditional advice that's being provided right now is to keep the individual out of the workplace for 14 days uh, and then to have them screened prior to coming back to work. If an individual is either on, uh, is on forced leave for exposure or self-quarantine, companies can choose whether or not they typically want to pay those employees if they are non-exempt. Uh, federal law, FLSA, does not require payment of non-exempt employees who are being paid on a pure hourly basis. Uh, this consideration does change for exempt employees who may be on a salary, uh, and have performed work during the work week, that could kick in obligations to pay, continue to pay those individuals. Uh, that being said, several of the companies that we're working with have chosen to offer paid leave or have provided employees with loans of sick, uh, basically PTO. So if an individual is out of PTO, extending them or loaning them an additional 14 days, which when they then return back to work, uh, they're essentially paying back. Uh, it's not that they owe you the wages back, it's simply that you know, your accumulated PTO from the time that you return to work will go to satisfy that 14-day deficiency. Uh, just a consideration that some employers are putting into place. That being said, anytime you're dealing with paid uh, time off from work, there are state law considerations which should be evaluated. Specifically, California is one state that requires mandated PTO in, in those situations, you cannot require an employee to utilize, typically cannot require an employee to utilize PTO when it's employer mandated leave. FMLA, um, FMLA could be implicated by an employee who's off work due to COVID. Uh, traditionally, influenza is not a qualifying event, but it is something to consider and evaluate based upon the severity of the condition and the time away from work. Uh, that same analysis typically applies for a disability, um, disability qualification under the ADA. Uh, 
one thing to consider with FMLA requests from employees that you may be receiving is school closings. Personally, this is important. I have three young children, uh, two of which are in school, and I'm kind of sitting on pins and needles hoping that school is not canceled, but it's possible. And if it is, and I have to stay home from work, that itself is not a protected event under FMLA. Now, you may have dependent care benefits which are being offered through your, your company to employees, and those should be applied when applicable. But in terms of FMLA certification protection, uh, a school closing absent an individual family member being sick is likely not a qualifying event. From an employment perspective, those are some of the, the hot button topics that we're currently experiencing and, and some of the questions that we're addressing. Obviously, there are a multitude of employment issues that have arisen in connection with, with this virus and the outbreak. Uh, I encourage all of you to look at our firm's toolkit, which I believe there is a link to uh, with this webinar. And we just published today a frequently asked question document in connection with employment law issues associated with COVID. So that's a great initial resource to consider. If you have any additional questions associated with labor and employment-based concerns, you can obviously feel free to contact one of our l &E attorneys. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Seth for any questions. Thanks a lot, Tyler. And we did get uh, a couple of questions come in. Uh, you know, one is, uh, is there any FDA report or confirmation to suggest COVID-19 can be transmitted through packaging for pharma or medical devices such as uh, folding cartons? I, I will say that FDA has this morning indicated that that is not uh, believed to be a possibility. That said, um, things have been changing, and that uh, pronouncement was really more directed at consumers, not at industry generally. Um, with any medical product, uh, there does need to be some consideration over new hazards or risks that are introduced. Um, given the fact that we have been seeing reports of persistence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 on surfaces, some level of potential disinfection or quarantining of product for the appropriate length of time before release for distribution may be appropriate, uh, but the decision is certainly up to the company as part of its quality system. So that's something that everyone should sort of way when they're putting together their their uh, policy on these issues, because it's always better to make these decisions now than under the, the uh, heat of a situation where you have a known employee that's sick that handled product and now you're dealing with the ramifications. And then the second question, I know uh, we've been having some discussions internally about this, but uh, there's a question over whether uh, agencies, both national or international, have found that the virus crosses to animal species, such as dogs or cats. Uh, anecdotally, there have been reports that uh, pets could be a disease vector. Certainly, certain wild animals may be a disease vector, but I don't know, Emily, if you can uh, opine on any of that specific to, you know, virus crossing into animal species like dogs or cats. Yeah, so the WHO in a specific report uh, targeted on COVID-19 does state that COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease. Um, however, the and the reservoir of it has been bats. Um, however, they do not state any indications on whether or not um, what I will say are general domesticated species of pets for humans um, 
have uh, either been a vector or have been able to have the disease transmitted to them. So it's still unclear on whether or not this could cross into cats and or dogs um, and then be transmitted back to a person. We've, we've seen some, you know, news reports um, and then some that have been debunked uh, related to this. So I think there's going to be, you know, more to come potentially on this issue, but at this point in time, um, no cats and dogs um, are not, not that we are aware of, um, you know, uh, seen as either a vector or as, um, uh, you know, con contracting uh, COVID-19 themselves. And also just to add, I mean, from a general GMP perspective, uh, the regulations do uh, mandate pest harborage, um, keeping, you know, unwanted vermin from the premises of a facility that uh, could potentially include wild animals, wild cats, wild dogs, um, even if they were originally domesticated. So um, the the risk to, I mean, FDA regulated facilities should, should keep that in mind, but pets specifically do not appear to be a, uh, a source of infection at this time. So if anyone else has any questions, we are available to answer them uh, now. And uh, if not, uh, please feel free to reach out to us directly. Um, we're available to discuss. As I mentioned before, we've uh, put together a template report for clients. Um, if you are considering developing a protocol, something that's more tailored to your production process as opposed to some of the more general pronouncements regarding restrictions on travel generally or uh, uh, general uh, health and safety tips like, you know, the repeated washing of hands and avoiding touching the face. If you're looking for something more targeted that will uh, help with FDA regulations, uh, please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, we did get another question come in um, asking, how will audit parameters change? Um, so from FDA's point of view, there may very well be fewer inspections. Um, we're certainly seeing that foreign inspections are not going to take place at the current time. We don't know how long that um, prohibition will, will last. Um, in all likelihood, we have, you know, when you think about international inspections, usually it requires from one to two months for FDA to schedule a foreign inspection and then carry it out. Um, so we have, uh, then, um, you know, it, it seems unlikely for inspections to take place any sooner than third quarter of this year um, for international inspections. Um, when the domestic situation um, becomes untenable, FDA may also suspend its uh, domestic audits. Um, as far as third-party audits go, we think that for, for a lot of facilities, the option to do an in-person domestic audit uh, may be um, passed over in favor of an alternative means of uh, conducting the uh, check for either uh, supplier controls or otherwise. For example, you could have uh, a virtual audit or a paper review of uh, production documentation um, as a way to uh, provide an alternate. Um, let me see, a bunch of questions did just come in while I was speaking. Um, so would the presence of a COVID-19 positive employee require an FDA reportable food registry notice? And that's an Excellent question. Um, it is 
hard to answer that specifically. Um, at the current time, FDA has suggested it is not a foodborne pathogen. That said, if your product is specifically uh, perishable and one that isn't necessarily uh, uh, potentially cleanable or would not be cooked by a consumer, something like fresh produce or uh, sprouts, then the answer may be yes. Uh, but it's always best to consider the potential issues now and have those decisions reviewed by appropriate counsel um, before making any decisions um, after the fact. Yeah, and uh, the only other thing, Seth, I would oh, add to that is, yeah. um, it, it, besides the fact that it's going to be product specific, it could also be a function and role of that employee. Um, are they someone who actually ends up on the manufacturing floor, or is it just somebody who works in your front office at your facility? Um, so there are a lot of facts that could go into that where um, you know, it, it, it's good to, one, develop your plan as a company, but to also reach out to counsel as to whether or not a reportable food registry notice would be necessary. Because if your food isn't necessarily contaminated, um, you know, that kind of report would not be needed. Yeah, I appreciate that additional information. Uh, we did get a question as to whether there are any links or resources available. I know our uh, firm is going to be putting up a or setting up a COVID-19 webpage, and we will be sure to forward those to everyone um, who's attending today. Uh, there will also be a recorded version of this uh, uh, presentation that you are welcome to share with any colleagues or um, others um, to understand uh, what the risks are. Outside of uh, our resources, obviously, there's the CDC, there's FDA, there's USDA, there's the World Health Organization. Um, given the, the differences among the various uh, health agencies as to how they're dealing with this, um, it, it does require some degree of um, uh, consolidating the, the information and compiling it in a way that works for your specific facility. Um, also, just so everyone is aware, um, the coronavirus webpage on the Hush Blackwell website is at HTTPS www.hushblackwell.com slash coronavirus. Um, and for those of you that like their iPhones, I've uh, just been informed that there is now a coronavirus emoji that you can use to send to all of your friends and neighbors. We've got one more question. Seth, Seth oh, I'm sorry, going to back this. And I don't mean to jump in, but uh, the EEOC has been publishing guidance from an employment perspective uh, concerning appropriate employer responses and ADA considerations. That's a, a good resource to consider. Uh, the CDC, as you mentioned, is a good resource to consider from an employment perspective as well. Uh, in addition, uh, outside of our firm's guidance that we're publishing on uh, the coronavirus webpage that we have, uh, in addition, SHRM, the Society of Human Resource Management, has been publishing quite a few articles uh, providing advice to employers in handling this situation. So those are a few resources that I would recommend considering. And then uh, we did have uh, another question about uh, whether we have seen a rise in claims of excusable delay. Um, I know that there have been questions coming from clients on this issue. It's not an area that I am specifically focused on, although I don't know if anyone else on our team here today can answer that question. But uh, we can, uh, if you follow up offline with me, I can uh, put you in touch with the right uh, 
uh, corporate attorneys that can help with that question. Uh, but anyone else on the team have any answers on that? All right, hearing no one up or <laughs> offering any opinions on that, uh, please feel free to, to reach out to me offline and I will be sure to put you in touch with the right uh, corporate attorney to, to answer those types of uh, supplier issues on uh, agreements. Well, I really appreciate everyone's time today. And uh, as we said, there's going to be a recording of this made. Uh, please feel free to for, uh, forward it along to any of your colleagues. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach me offline. Uh, we have put together a, a very comprehensive tailored template for FDA regulated industries, which they can use to help develop a policy governed by an attorney-client privileged review, uh, and uh, we would be more than happy to help you with that process. So uh, please feel free to reach out to us, and uh, thank you very much.